Hi, I'm Lori Gottlieb. I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm the author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, and I co-host the Dear Therapist podcast. There's this big idea in your TED Talk, and it's a big piece of the book as well, that we are all unreliable narrators of our own lives. So I want to talk to you about that idea, but I also want to talk about the thing that to me is kind of a, a funny meta level, which is that you are also literally the narrator of the book about your own life. So how do you think about it in general for all of us? And then how did you think about it for yourself when you were crafting like a quite literal narrative that then people are going to read about your life? That's such a great question. Nobody has ever asked me about the part about my narrating the book and the unreliable narrator part of that. I think that we like to think that we're reliable narrators because we feel like I'm telling the objective version of what happened. And yet we are all subjective. And it's not that what we're saying is untrue. What we're saying is absolutely true, but from our own vantage point. So we're leaving out a lot of things. We're bringing in certain things, certain threads to the story that we want the other person to hear. We're kind of minimizing the parts that maybe we don't want them to hear as much and the parts that maybe we don't want to acknowledge to ourselves. So when I was writing, maybe you should talk to someone, I was following the lives of four very different patients as I was working with them as their therapist. But I included my narrative, and I'm the fifth patient in the book where I go to therapy after something happens in my life, because I felt like it would be really unreliable if I positioned myself as the expert up on high. And so I wanted to show as, you know, in all of my subjectivity, how I do the same things in therapy that my therapy clients do with me in terms of being an unreliable narrator. And for the first part of the book, I'm a very unreliable narrator with my own therapist. One of the things that you did with your own therapist was saying the same story over and over, hoping that you would convince them that like your perspective on it was of course the right one and the only one, which is, at least for me, I certainly can relate to doing that in, in my own therapy of saying like, my way has to be the only way, right? Like, give me some confirmation on that, which of course a good therapist is not gonna do. Well, I think that's the difference between what I talk about in the book, idiot compassion and wise compassion. So idiot compassion is what we do with our friends. So after this, this, this breakup happened for me, everybody said about my boyfriend, you know, oh, you dodged a bullet, you know, he's a jerk, all of these things. But that really wasn't the story, but it was the story that felt comforting to me. And I think my friends truly believed that because I was telling them a certain story. It was the accurate story from my perspective, but it wasn't the whole story. And so idiot compassion is when our friends say, listen to what happened with my boss, with my coworker, with my mother, with my partner, with my sibling. And we say, yeah, you're right. That's terrible. They're wrong. Because we think we're being supportive. We're supporting our friend's version of the story. And we, and we take that as truth. But I think if you listen to your friends long enough, you start to hear a pattern. Like they've told me these kinds of stories before, maybe different characters, maybe different scenario. It's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. We do not say that to our friends. Wise compassion is what you get in therapy. Wise compassion is where we hold up a mirror to you and we help you to see something that you aren't willing or able to acknowledge about your own role in the situation. And that doesn't mean we're blaming you for the situation at all. There's the word compassion in there. It's about what is your part in this dance with this other person? We're all doing a dance when we're interacting with someone. What are your dance steps in this and can you change them? It really struck me in your book and, and in prepping for this interview and watching other, other talks and interviews that you've given, the idea of relationships as a dance, not just the therapeutic relationship, but all of them. Because one thing that you say that I, I think is really revelatory for me and for a lot of people is the idea that you can't change what the other person does, but if you keep dancing in the same way, they're gonna keep dancing in the same way with you. That's right. I think a lot of people come to therapy wanting something to change, and what they want to change is usually someone else. So <laughs> it's how can I change this other person? How can I get them to do something different? And the way you do that is you do something different. So you can't change another person, but you can influence another person to see if they will change. And I see this in couples a lot. When couples come in for therapy, it's kind of like each person wants the other person to be the first to make the change. In other words, to change the dance first. And I always say to people before they even come in for their first session, what is something that you would like to do differently in this relationship, regardless of whether the other person changes? 
if you were going to be your best self in this relationship, what would that look like? What is something that you can do better in this relationship? And they come in with that mindset of, I'm not here to change the other person. I'm here to do something different myself and to see what's here when I show up in this way. So the thing about the dance is, and this is like with boundaries too. People say, oh, I'm going to set a boundary with this other person. I'm going to tell them, you can't talk to me that way, or you can't bring up this topic or, you know, whatever the thing might be. And that's not really what a boundary is. A boundary is a request that I would like it if you would not do that. And it's the consequence that you're going to do, not what they need to do. So, and if you do, I'm going to end the conversation and we'll come and we'll talk about it another time. So the boundary is about you changing your dance steps. It's, I would like it if you would change these dance steps, but in the meantime, if you don't, I'm going to leave the dance floor. And what we find, by the way, is that if people change their dance steps, that the other person is either going to change their dance steps too, or they're going to fall flat on the dance floor. If they won't do the new dance, then you have a choice. Do I want to have this person as my dance partner? Or is this not some, is this not a dance that I want to do? Mm. I find that the moments that are the most powerful or the moments that really have changed my life have been realizing that there are these invisible systems that I have built around myself that seem instinctive and natural. And of course, that's just how things have to be. When someone acts like this, I must act like that. And to just get the tiniest bit of distance to see that actually that's something that I built. That's a choice that I'm making. And I don't necessarily have to make those choices. I don't have to dance in that way if it's not serving me. Just seeing that it is a possible change, even before I make it, has been uh, kind of a mind-blowing revelation for me in in therapy. Right. I think that we forget that we're all co-creating a dynamic with a person that it's not this person is bad and I am good. Um, This person is toxic. That's another thing that gets thrown around on social media a lot. And, you know, I'm the healthy one because if you're participating in an unhealthy dynamic, you're co-creating that with the other person. I think a scene in the book that people talk about a lot is the moment when I'm in therapy and I'm feeling really trapped. And, you know, I feel like I don't have any choices. And my therapist says to me, you know, you remind me of this cartoon. And it's of a prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out. But on the right and the left, it's open, no bars. So the question is, why is it that sometimes we can't see that it's open? And why is it that even when we do see that it's open, we don't walk around those bars? Mm. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the idea that there is some comfort, it's, it's discomfort, but there is a way of abdicating responsibility for our own lives if we say the problem is someone else or something else. And if we walk around those bars with freedom, the freedom that we would then have comes responsibility. And now we're responsible for our lives. We can't blame our unhappiness, our stuckness, whatever it might be, on someone else. Mm. Now we know we have the freedom to change that. And if we don't, we only have ourselves to blame. Mm. You're not just obviously a really talented therapeutic practitioner. You're also a really talented writer and editor. And I know that you have spoken about how you see those as being complementary skills. In, in fact, in some ways, a similar skill. Yeah, I always love stories and the human condition. And I started first working in film development after college, and then I was an executive at NBC. And when I was at NBC, I was working on a show you may have heard of called ER. Um, I was not a writer on the show. I was an executive at the network. Our consultant on the show, who was an ER doc, kept saying to me, I think you like it better here than you like your day job. <laughs> and it was because ER, of course, was this incredible show and the stories were, were so real, but they were also fiction. <laughs> and when you're in an ER and you see these inflection points in people's lives, I was fascinated by that. And so I ended up going to medical school. I went up to Stanford and I started writing when I was in medical school and I left to become a writer. And it was later that I came back and and decided to become a therapist. But I think that they're all related. They're all about stories and the human condition. And I feel like as a therapist, when I'm sitting in the therapist chair, I almost feel like an editor, that people come in with their stories and they come in with these faulty narratives. And a lot of them are these narratives that we've carried around for so long that we don't even realize that we're holding them. 
these stories that someone else has told us about ourselves that were much more about the storyteller, the, the person who told us this when we were younger, than about us. But we interpreted it to be about us. So we took away these stories like, I'm unlovable, or nothing will ever work out for me, or I can't trust anyone. Um, you know, just the way you see the world. And you act out those stories every day in all of your interactions without being aware of it. So one of the things I really do as an editor is to help people to edit their stories and make sure that they reflect their world in the present. And I, I feel like as a writer, the arc that people go through in therapy very much mirrors the arc that people go through in any kind of narrative. There's a chapter in your book called How Humans Change. And, and you talk about the, the steps that change actually takes. One of the things that I heard you say that, that I was really, I'm still no, kind of gnawing on and mulling over is the idea that change is complicated because with change comes loss. Yes. And I think that can be really one of the big things that holds us back. It is, even when the change is positive, it still comes with loss because we tend to cling to the familiar. The familiar is something that feels comfortable to us, even if it makes us miserable. It's still something that we know. If we haven't processed the ways that we've been hurt in the past, we tend to do this thing, it's, you know, this phrase repetition compulsion, where we try to master the situation uh, that we couldn't master when we were younger. This time I will win. But we don't know that going in. We meet someone and we think this person's really different from the person who hurt me. This person is not at all like my alcoholic parent, my parent with anger issues, my parent who was very withholding. And then you get into the relationship and it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> this feels really familiar. And the reason that change is so hard is because even though we're not happy in that situation, we know it and humans don't do well with uncertainty. And the other thing about change is, you know, as you were saying in that How Humans Change chapter, is that there are stages of change. You know, this is why New Year's resolutions fail so much, is because people don't realize that there are stages to change. And it starts with pre-contemplation, where you don't even know you're thinking about making a change. Then contemplation, where you are wanting to make a change, but you're not ready to do it yet. And that's when people land in therapy. Then there's um, preparation, where you're actually taking steps to prepare to make the change. And then there's action, where you make the change. But that is not the last step. And so a lot of people, this is why people tend to fall off from change. The last step is actually maintenance. And maintenance is how do you maintain the change? And a big misconception about maintenance is that once you've made the change, you're just maintaining it and you're just going along. And if you fall back, you failed. That is not true. It's like shoots and ladders maintenance. And what happens is until a habit becomes something that starts to feel familiar to you, going back to how we get comfort from familiarity, you're going to keep falling back. And so you need to have a lot of self-compassion. So someone might say, oh, I was going to break up with that person, but oh no, I called them and I got back together with them. And then you just say, okay, but that was that day. And now you just get back on track. Or, oh, I was going to you know, exercise and then I didn't do it. It's okay. So that happened that day. And I think that people think that if you have self-compassion, that you're not holding yourself accountable, mm. which is just not true. And I just want to say that self-flagellation does not work in the long term. It might work in the short term, but it does not work in the long term. It's interesting with maintenance as a form of change, because I think that with some pretty dramatic forms of change, one that comes to mind immediately for me is sobriety. The maintenance piece, I think, feels really natural to people. The idea of like, I'm four years sober, I'm 30 days sober. The idea that it is an active thing. It's not just like you decided to be sober and that it's done, that it is something that needs to be maintained. But with other forms of, of change, people sometimes, they don't give themselves kind of the pride that people feel in 10 years of sobriety. If it's like 10 years of working to set healthy boundaries with family members, you don't, you don't kind of like pat yourself on the back. Right, and I think that's because people are, we're so self-critical with, with ourselves and we don't realize it. And what we say to ourselves isn't always kind or true or useful. You know, an example of this is I had this client and she was so self-critical and didn't realize it. And this could have been anybody because so many people are like this. I'm like this with myself. And I said to her, I want you to listen for this voice in your head and I want you to write down everything you say to yourself over the course of the week and come back next week and let's talk about it. And so she comes back the next week and she starts to read her list and she starts crying. And she said, 
I'm such a bully to myself. I had no idea. So I think that the ways when we talk about change and maintenance, this kind, true, useful is going to be especially important. Mm. We should always be kind and true and useful, not just with ourselves, but with other people. I think it would it would really change the dialogue if we use those criteria. Do you recommend that people literally keep a list of what they're saying to themselves or, or what's the first step in, in making that shift? I think the first step is, is yes, writing down what you say to yourself and then and then looking at the why, you know, whose voice is that? Usually it's not your voice. We are not born that way. We are not born with that critical voice in our head. So usually it came from somewhere. It might be someone in your environment when you were growing up. It might be the culture. It could be the school system. Maybe you had a learning disability and people told you that you were not smart and that's just not true. So where were you getting these messages? Whose stories are they? Again, going back to getting rid of those faulty narratives and rewriting those, that's a lot of the work of, of I think, getting that voice in your head to be kind and true and useful. We've talked about some of the um, patients who you talk about in the book. There's, there's four patient stories and then your own as the fifth. One of the patients who I want to talk about is, is John. He's, he's really disrespectful. He's really rude to you. And that is a person who I think many people would kind of question and, and did question to you, like, why, why do you take care of someone who is going to treat you badly, even as the person who's trying to, um, to provide care for him? But you have a really interesting reframing of why some people do act in this kind of obnoxious, rude, disrespectful way. Yeah. You know, when John came in, he was so insulting to me and so rude. He was paying in cash because he didn't want his wife to know that he was coming to therapy. He was a, a very successful person in his professional world. And he said he was coming to me because um, I was a nobody and he wouldn't run into anyone he knew in the waiting room. He said that he was paying in cash. It would be just like, just like I was his mistress. And then he said, actually, you're not the kind of person I would choose as a mistress, more like my hooker. And I think that the way he was so extreme in pushing me away, that it said to me that he was very damaged somewhere, that, that getting close to people was terrifying for him. And I think that when we can't speak with words, we speak with our behavior. Behavior is another way of communicating. And a lot of times people misinterpret the behavior. So they say, this person's an asshole. Well, no, this person is actually terrified is what they are. So yes, their, their behavior is not really acceptable, but, but the way that they're, they're coping with their pain is to make sure that nobody gets close to them so that they don't get more hurt. So I was really curious because again, going back to stories, I think everybody has this story and I need to get at what the story is to help them. And so I was really curious to, because I thought nobody else is gonna spend the time and listen to this person. So what would happen if I was able to see if he could talk about that story with me after we get past the behavior way of speaking. You know, we, we, we kind of, we act out the unspeakable and they wanted him to like, you know, understand why he was acting out, what was unspeakable to him. And when people read the book, they say, oh, I really hated John at the beginning. And by the end of the book, they say, I just wanted to hug mm -hmm. him. He is my favorite person in the book. It, it's also, I feel like there's an in, in important disclaimer here that for you, because you are, you know, in a, a therapeutic setting, it makes sense to, to deal with someone who is going to be disrespectful and obnoxious and try and get to the root of it. But um, for the rest of us, we can maybe use those ideas that they are acting in a certain way because of something that happened to them. We can use that to have more compassion, but it also doesn't mean that we have to then tolerate that person treating us poorly. Absolutely not. So the, the point that I want, the reason I wanted to help him was because he was ruining all of his relationships outside of the therapy room because mm. nobody would tolerate that kind of behavior. His marriage was about to end, all kinds of things like that. And the therapy room is a microcosm of what happens out there. So whatever people do out there, they will reenact that with you. I think people forget that you as a therapist are having a relationship with your client. And so whatever they do out there, if they, if they don't tell the truth out there, they're not gonna tell the truth in here. If they are easily injured out there, they will be easily injured in the therapy room. Um, you know, what, if they kind of distract and avoid out there, they're gonna do that in the therapy room. And it's a really good place for you to be able to talk about it in a way that it's really hard to do outside of the therapy room with, with the people in your life. 
since you are inside this therapy room, you know, that's a huge part of how you're spending your time and you're hearing a lot of traumatic things. You're hearing a lot of painful things, heavy, dark stuff. Does therapy feel like a depressing uh, profession to you or is there instead, do you feel like you get to take that and transform it somehow? So I'm smiling because I think that's such a misconception about the work of therapy. I think it's the most inspiring, hopeful profession. I'm, I'm so inspired by the people that I see. And I, I think even, you know, the idea that everybody is, is, I feel like a hero in the sense of they're making these small changes all the time that are really, really hard to make, things they've never done before in their lives. And you get to be a witness and a guide as they go along and do this. And I, I think that we don't have forever and people forget that. You know, life has a 100% mortality rate. That's not just for other people, even though we like to believe that. We are all going to die. None of us will get out of here alive. And that's not a morbid thought. It's, I think, a very, it, it's a thought that gives us intention. How do I want to spend my time that I know is limited while I'm here and able to? And I think that when you're in therapy, you're much more aware of the, the limited amount of time that you have to make your relationships the way you want to make them, to do the things with your life that you really want to do and not be stuck by old narratives or these ideas about what you can and can't do with your life and really realizing that we have agency to choose how we want to live our lives. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about like the nitty gritty, if you're a person who's listening and has not ever had a therapeutic relationship about how you actually get started and what you should look for and how, how you actually go about setting up that first appointment and, and all of the, those pieces of that. I think what's unique about therapy is that the most important factor in the quote unquote success of your therapy is your relationship with your therapist. And that matters more than the modality that they're using, than the number of years of experience than they have, what training they have, all of that matters. So I'm not saying that doesn't matter, it's very important. But it doesn't matter as much as that one factor, which is how do you connect with that therapist? When people go to therapy for the first time and they, they sit in an office with some stranger, that there are two questions that I think are helpful to ask at the end of that session of yourself, which is, did I feel like this person understood me? Did I feel understood? Um, and as much as someone can understand you and meeting you for the first time for 50 minutes, but there's a vibe. And the other part of it is, did this person say something that made me think about something potentially in a new way? So we're not gonna challenge people too much in a first session because we're just getting to know them. But we might say something like, and what do you think this other person meant when they said that? Or has this ever happened to you before? Um, you know, or where did you get that message, right? Just to get them to think about something a little bit differently from the content, and we want them to go more into the process. The content is the story they're telling, the process is what's happening underneath, what's driving it. Mm. And I think if you have both of those things, I would go back for a second session, but that doesn't mean you're in therapy with that person. It's like, it would, that would almost be like going on a first date and saying, I'm gonna marry this person because we had a good first date. Therapy is, is very expensive in terms of both time and money. So you don't wanna spend a lot of time, but I think in those first one, two, three sessions, you're gonna start to feel either more comfortable with this person, or you're gonna start to feel like, I'm not really sure about this. So I think that people forget that you are free to go find the right therapist for you. Just to make this concrete, right? Like I have, I've been in therapy with a few different people and, and I found people who were really helpful and I found people where I had a session I was like, that was not great. But I've, I've been trying to convince my dad that he should try therapy and that it would be helpful for him. And, and he finally was like, okay, how do I do it? So what I told him is I, I said, like, start by like, just get a list of therapists who are around you in your in your city. Send them just a very simple email that says like, hi, I'm looking to start therapy. Are you accepting new patients? Some of those people will write back. They'll say no. A lot of therapists are very busy right now. Right. Like, so they'll say no. If you get a few people who say yes, then I told him, I think that many people are open to this idea that you could ask for like a five to 10 minute or 15 minute phone call just to chat and say what you're kind of looking to work on and just hear their voice even, because maybe you'll get like the immediate sense of it's not even worth paying for one session because I know that I don't like this person. Before you even get into it, do you have something like for that 
first phone call or for even in the email when you reach out that you should be looking for? I really feel like you have to sit in the room with the person for 50 minutes to really feel like, huh, this is what it's going to be like. For example, when I called my therapist for the first yeah. time, he was almost said nothing hmm. <laughs> on the phone. Like, like I was in crisis and he was, you know, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I have this time available. Great. See you then. Hmm. Right. And, and I made a joke on the phone. Like I said, it's, I've been, I'm pre-shrunk. Like I know what it's like. I'm a therapist. <laughs> so I'm pre -shrunk. You know, like, and, and he didn't laugh. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, it's okay. I don't need a sense of humor, but he ended up being very funny in person. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, I, I just think that you have to sit in a room with somebody one time to know what it's like. Um, and also, I just want to say something about men in therapy. I'm really glad that your dad is going because so many times men will come in and, you know, once you get to know them, they'll say, I've never told anyone this before. And they literally have not told a soul. And even if they have a, a great marriage or they have great family or great friends, they just haven't. Our culture has such stigma around men being vulnerable. And women will also come in and they'll say, you know, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother, my sister, my best friend. So they've told maybe one, two, three people, but they feel like they haven't told anyone. And I think that's such a metaphor for, you know, what it, what it feels like to be isolated in your own experience. Whereas women feel isolated if they can only tell one, two or three people, men truly have no one to tell. And I see this in couples therapy where if it's a heterosexual couple, I see all kinds of couples. Um, usually it's the woman who will say to her husband or her partner, um, you know, I just, I want you to open up to me. I, I feel like we're disconnected. I, I wanna know what's going on with you. Share with me your inner world. And they'll be right there on the couch in front of me and he'll start to open up to her and he'll start to talk about what's going on with him. And maybe he tears up or maybe he starts crying. And inevitably, some version of the following happens. She will look at me like a deer in headlights. Like, I don't feel safe when you don't open up to me because then we feel disconnected. But I don't feel safe when you're crying in front of me either. Mm. So this is why it's so hard for men, especially, to come to therapy. They need to challenge sort of the people out there who on the intellectually want them to be open and vulnerable, but also have their own kind of societal bias against men being vulnerable. Okay, so uh, a question that I have then to, to talk about this therapeutic relationship a little bit more and starting one is, okay, so two, two questions. One, a really quick one is, should you tell the therapist when you first are meeting with them that you're seeing other therapists? Like, is it like when you go on a date and you're just like, by the way, I, we're not exclusive yet. I, I'm seeing other people. Should you actually say like, I, I'm evaluating therapists and I, I want to have a session with you, but I'm meeting with a couple other practitioners as well. A hundred percent. Is that a weird thing? No, it's not a weird thing. It's the first session. It's a consultation for both people. It's a consultation for the therapist to see, is this someone that I think I can help? Is this someone where maybe their issue is something that's outside of my area of expertise? Or maybe I think there's someone who has more expertise in this area that I would like them to see. I think that that would be a better fit for them. Um, hmm. And it's a, it's a consultation for you coming in to see, how, again, how do I feel with this person? Um, not just is this person validating my experience, but again, is this person going to challenge me? That's so important because I think there's this misconception that therapy is this thing where you go in every week, you download the problem of the week, and then you leave. And, and we always say that insight is the booby prize of therapy that you can have all the insight in the world, but if you don't make changes out in the world, the insight is useless. So it's one thing for a mm. client to go home and say, oh, look, I got into that fight with my partner this weekend and I understood why. And I'll say, great, <laughs> but did you do something different? Well, no. <laughs> so it's okay, so now you have the insight. Now, what are you going to do differently now that you understand why that happens in that way? One of the funny downsides of like the, for lack of a better term, like TikTok therapy, is people being able to be like, and that's my toxic trait, and I don't do anything about it, but I'm aware that it's a bad thing that I do that's unhelpful in my life, and I just keep doing it. It's like, well, right. that's only the first, that's the inside piece, you gotta do the action piece too. And I think that that when you're with a good therapist, they're, they're going to make sure that you're addressing that. 
So you don't just skate by. And when people talk about, you know, I think a good analogy for therapy is kind of like physical therapy, that mm. it, in the beginning, it's it's really hard, it's work, and your muscles are gonna be sore, because that's what happens, but you're gonna get stronger through this process, and it's mm. not gonna hurt as much, and you're gonna come out, and you're gonna feel much better. I think there's a cultural idea of therapy sometimes that is like, you enter therapy, and then you have a therapist for the rest of your life. and. Obviously, you wouldn't think of that with physical therapy. Like if I get tendonitis in my shoulder, I'm there until we resolve the issue. And then I go and keep doing those exercises on my own. But I don't st keep seeing the physical therapist forever. So people leave when they feel like, you know what, I'm really functioning well. I understand this pattern better. Um, I feel really good. So I'm going to go and you go. A lot of people are afraid to leave therapy because they feel like they're going to slip back or they're not going to have the support. But good therapy helps you to have the resources to do this yourself. And if you need to come back, you can come back. If you are at a moment where you feel like, okay, I've gotten the skills and it feels like I'm there and I don't feel like I'm getting pushed anymore. How, because people can be really scared about this. It does feel like a breakup sometimes to end therapy. Oh, do you have any tips for people who are trying to figure out how to end that relationship, even if it's just a temporary ending like you talked about? Yeah, I, I think that people need to know that therapists don't feel like you're breaking up with them. That, you know, it's, it's a weird business model because our goal is to get you to leave. That is, that is success for us. So our goal is to put ourselves out of business. So we want to make sure it's not sort of like in the middle of something really deep that's really painful that you're avoiding and now you decide you want to leave, but you're actually leaving for because you feel like you are at a point where you've dealt with the things you want to deal with and now you're going to go out into the world. Well, Lori Gottlieb, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for your work, for your podcast, for your talks, for your book, for all, all of the things that you bring to the world. It's really, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, thanks so much for the conversation. I really enjoyed it.